another of our ongoing lecture series. I'm glad to see you all here, really, uh, especially since all our notices apparently just went out uh, with the uh, CMP Stravis uh, because um, some of us felt that uh, that most of you ended up sending out as many as I could on my own as far as the mailing list, and I'm really very glad to see you here. You might be interested in some of the previous lectures. I hope you were able to attend all of them. We've had, and, uh, and we've had acclaimed uh, academics, doctorates, both Macedonian and others, who are interested in the history and things Macedonian. We have most of the time been able to videotape the lectures, and they are available through the Historical Society. I just wanted to review them for you now so that, I can, that you can see the scope that we've been able to achieve with our lectures. We presented lectures on Alexander the Great by Professor Keatley. Although the name doesn't sound it, he is Macedonian. Early Macedonian immigration to Canada was expertly covered by Dr. Lillian Petrov. For our first annual banquet, Dr. Dushko Aleksovsky from Skopje spoke on ancient stone writings dating back to 5000 BC. The Begalsi, the lost children of Macedonia, presented a touching presentation. While Trajan Dimitrio gave us an informed and chilling recounting of the Macedonian Canadian human rights and how it has affected us in the past and present. Amnesty International was good enough to send one of their members to give us their opinion as well as to uh, the Macedonian Canadian human rights. We had Father David Belden, who has the only English speaking congregation of Eastern Orthodoxy in Toronto, as well as George Janewski, our acclaimed icon artist that has beautified the Macedonian church in Thorncliffe. Dr. Andrew Rosas, University of Toronto professor of history specializing in Eastern Europe and Macedonia in particular gave us a history lesson that we who were born here have not had an opportunity to hear. We're very fortunate enough to obtain a copy of a video featuring frescoes and icons called Origine Medici, which had been produced by Dr. Grado Zdravkovic of Skopje. It was informative as well as entertaining. Dr. Alex Jigarov added to our knowledge of folk medicine with Baba was a doctor. We organized the Macedonian Day of Renaissance, wherein we had a day of seminars and workshops conducted by either members of the board or specialists in Macedonian dance, song, culture, business, language, borders, and organizing a culture, cultural group. At the banquet that night, we heard from one of our speakers today, Christina Kramer, the professor who teaches Macedonian at the University of Toronto. I enjoyed her so much that night that I wanted to hear more and wanted you to hear her if you were not able to attend last April. Language has and still is a hot topic, politically, ethnically, and historically. In organizing these lectures, I have sought to inform, educate, entertain, expand our horizons and open our minds. I hope that's what, that's why you have chosen to attend. And now to introduce Joe Schauer is Christina Kramer. She uh, will do the honors as uh, he is a, uh, a colleague of hers at the University of Toronto and he will be our first speaker. Christina? It gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Joseph Schaller, who is now in his second year at the University of Toronto. I need the mic? Yeah. Ooh, all right. Somewhat. Echoes in my ear. Um, what, before I tell you specifically Joe's, um, Joe Schaller's uh, educational background, 
I'd like to point out that in North America, as far as I know, there have been five doctoral dissertations devoted exclusively to the Macedonian language. Mine was number three. Joseph Shalitz was number four. So two out of the five were the Department of Slavic Languages at the University of North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina? No, that was a former life. University of Toronto. <laughs> Professor Shalitz uh, did his doctoral research, um, defended his dissertation at the University of California, Berkeley, after doing a year of uh, field research in Skopje, Berovo, Struvica, and Kriva Palavka. He is a specialist on uh, South Slavic dialect, particularly Macedonian dialect. He is involved with a uh, research project being conducted in Russia at the Institute for Slavic and Balkan Studies on a major work on Slavic dialectology, and he is the uh, expert on Macedonian and Bulgarian dialects. He is also an expert on diachronic, the history of development of uh, modern Slavic languages. And at the University of Toronto, he teaches history of West Slavic languages, Polish, Czech, and Slovak, as well as a course in Old Church Slavonic. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Joseph Chalice. I'm trying to uh, cover a fairly wide uh, array of Slavic languages here in Toronto. Um, it's only fair to take it with a grain of salt because nobody could be such a Shetan Chovek as to know them. Did everyone know them all as well? It really should be. One should. Um, but uh, today um, I had a chance to meet some of the people in the audience and was already impressed by um, their interest and their apparent knowledge and depth of. Um, certain aspects of Macedonian history and archaeology. Um, I, as a linguist, will confine most of my remarks to the language material itself and will humbly defer to them in regard to many questions regarding the antiquities of the Balkan Peninsula, including, of course, in the primary sense, Macedonian. Um, so nonetheless, uh, looking at uh, Macedonian in the sort of linguistic language as well as uh, perspective, uh, I'd like briefly to place Macedonian uh, within the Slavic language family, of which it is currently a member, and also give a sort of general picture of Slavic within Indo-European, um, this being the sort of broader language family of which Slavic is a major representative. Um, of course, the geography here is probably well known to all of you, but briefly, um, Macedonia uh, and Macedonian represents, in effect, the southernmost a position of Slavic languages within Central and Eastern Europe. And at yet at the same time, as I will uh, turn to and point out later in my talk, and indeed it's probably fairly well known here, uh, Macedonia nonetheless, and Macedonian, occupies in a sense a central position and a very primary position in the historical connections that evolved between the Slavic languages. And this is due in fact begins with that same geographical location, um, being situated as they were uh, so close to the Byzantine Empire and to some of the first um, attempts to codify in that sense of a written language, uh, one of the Slavic languages. And of course I'm referring hereby to the apostolic nation of Cyril and Methodius. So what we end up uh, in that, just to sort of highlight sort of one of the uh, aspects of my talk in that sense, uh, Macedonian occupying sort of a dual position, as it were on the periphery, the southern periphery of Slavic as a linguistic including Russian, Polish, Czech, Slovak, and many other languages. And yet, um, central in a cultural sense, as a center for radiation of um, the um, Orthodox faith and for literacy among the Slavs. And in another sense, Macedonia is also, as it were, central in that uh, with regard to, ah, you still hearing in the back? Is it, is it clear enough? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, right. Thanks. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I'm a doctor of a different sort, and I've developed one by bending over books too much, probably. Um, 
Uh, the other sense of which I view personally as a linguist um, and one who's very interested in the Macedonian language, Macedonian and Central, is that given its location right at the heart of the Balkan Peninsula, it's in a sense a, a linguistic and cultural crossroads for Southern Europe. And uh, I'm going to be looking at some of the obvious, uh, very well known, probably linguistic evidence for that. So that, in a sense, is a part of what uh, the three points I want to address in my talk. But uh, another sort of personal note I'd like to add, that's particularly toward the end of the talk, as a Slavist and a philologist, someone who's interested in languages and literatures, is that Macedonia and Macedonian and Macedonian dialects um, increasingly have uh, drawn the interest of Slavic scholars. Slavic scholars who are working very narrowly within Slavic studies, uh, strictly speaking, um, as opposed to history or let's say the, you know, the cultural uh, importance of Macedonia and its role in European history. Um, and this um, whole process began uh, towards the end of the 19th century and continued into the early 20th century, and then sort of abated after some initial um, decades of interest and um, I would, in a sense, like to um, be a small part of some attempt to uh, bring a focus back upon um, the Macedonian contribution to reconstructing the history of Slavic as a linguistic continuum. Um, so then if I may go back to, in essence, the beginning of my talk. Um, in other words, Macedonian as a Slavic language, Slavic languages as members of the Indo-European language family. I mean, to take some trivial examples, which, um, whether or not you learned English or Macedonian as your first time, you would know right off. And they point to something very deep in terms of historical connection. Examples like the word brat, and then we have brother in English, um, or fraternity, derived from that, the, uh, the, the Greek word. Uh, it, uh, sestra, it's really a virtually identical to sister. You take uh, numerals. There's another area in which we look for ancient connections between languages because they don't get to be replaced very often. Uh, take the word three and three in German. Um, and immediately, this led uh, scholars, um, even at the end of the 18th century, Sawyer and Jones among them, to begin to uh, bring Slavic material into the comparative work of deciding uh, what the Indo-European language might look like to begin with, and also what are all the members of that language family. Um, there are other uh, instances that where we have uh, very much uh, the same stock in common if you look at the basic vocabulary of the language, but it's not immediately evident to us, however. If we take the word jema, um, it probably wouldn't occur to one immediately in the sense that three and three is obviously uh, they're closely related. If we take the English word queen, but quen and jem ultimately come, back, come from the same root. It just, it's undergone a different evolution in the course of English. And if you compare that pair, and you take it back to European, in fact, it's the Macedonian, which is thought to be the original meaning in, in a very primary sense. And also most of the other Slavic languages. Um, if, you, if anyone is somewhat familiar with Russian, we see a secondary formation going in Russian where Shina strictly just means wife, but Zhinchina then means uh, woman as well. So, but in a sense, uh, Macedonian reflects an earlier uh, stage where uh, there was originally at least no uh, need felt to add secondary uh, term for, for wife. Um, another type of um, more uh, remote connection that nonetheless is quite authentic is the kind that you find between Macedonian and Slavic and <coughs> neighboring languages not of the English kind, you know, the Germanic stock. If you take Lithuanian, very proximate to Slavic in the sense of Russian, but actually quite close to Macedonian, it's, it's let's say not one. <laughs> you take the word Ranka, in uh, Lithuanian meaning hand, and you have Raka in Macedonian and Polish. Uh, it has a nasal vowel um, sound in there. Um, if you take the example for the word for head, uh, Glava in um, uh, Lithuanian, you have Glava in Macedonian again. Um, these connections can't be really accidental. They all point back to a common ancestry in terms of language heritage. Um, and then but within Again, just to fill you here for a moment, the connections between Lithuanian and Slavic, even as seen in Macedonian. We take Devet, this word for nine, and we find Devini in Lithuanian. Then we compare that to most of the rest of Indo-European. You get, well, in our word for November, the ninth month originally according to the old calendar. Uh, Novem and Devem are the same root, and we see this again in English, nine. Um, but what happened that's interesting in Slavic and Lithuanian is they're saying Devin, a Nevin, for 
for nine, eight bit Devon. And this is this uh, particular um, feature that goes uh, way back in, in their history that sets them apart from virtually all of the Indo European Excuse languages. Excuse me. Yes. November is the eleventh month. It is, of course. But um, if you're counting according to the old calendar, uh, by which I don't mean uh, old Orthodox calendar, but calendars, uh, uh, there are many calendars which originated early in the spring, in spring. And but by that time, uh, the, the 11th month, counting from, let's say, the uh, second or third month, or the third, begin in March itself, should be the ninth month. Well, and that's it. It's like September. Exactly. Yeah, seven. We begin, this process begins with September for seventh. October for eighth, November for ninth, uh, counting from you know early spring. The Latin, Latin year. Right. Yes, that's yeah. right. The Latin year. Um, now the other sorts of uh, connections we find uh, uh, again, I think if you ponder the Zol, as in, which also gives us Bol, of course, and the old English word Bale for a valley or German Tal, these uh, go back. Uh, they're not borrowed between each other, but go back to a common source. Um, usually, we can recognize borrowings between languages because. Um, particularly of the later kind associated with cult cultural dispersion. Um, to give you a trivial example in English, uh, we just, even though the word taco has been in English for quite a while, um, in going to Los Angeles, I uh, may have noticed some early age. Um, nonetheless, uh, we wouldn't, if, you, if we came back a thousand years from now, um, uh, we would have to explore precisely why that wasn't uh, an English word from the very beginning, which would be prior to this time, the 20th century. Um, we also uh, find a very interesting type of vocabulary that comes out in sort of what I would call more the higher cultural sphere in Macedonian that goes back to, in a sense, a, a connection with Sanskrit or the precursor of Sanskrit, um, the whole language of, of uh, India and the Hindu culture. Um, I have in mind the word for God, for example, bulk, and obviously connected to bulk God. It must mean some, um, someone blessed by God or endowed or assisted by God. And then there's this, um, this uh, ancient Sanskrit term, bhagas, for a wealth or for a divinity associated with wealth. Or if we take the word rai, you know, for uh, paradise, uh, we find words in old Avestan texts, these are sacred scriptures of old Persian, um, uh, where we find rai in precisely the same meaning of paradise. Um, presumably, um, when you're talking about the sort of vocabulary that has to, that's common to virtually most or every Slavic language, and that um, re you know res resonates so deeply with the cultural roots of the Slavic languages. We're talking about connections that spread out into the rest of the European languages at a very deep level. And so that's what I meant by putting it in the European context. That ultimately many of the languages we know of Europe come from the same common stock. And um, there's also particularities within Slavic that seem to set it apart. This use of the word originally for nursing. Um, to give you the word for child, that um, we don't find that particular development anywhere else in the year. I think it's a rather uh, appropriate and, and touching sort of uh, um, connection evolved. Um, now, one of the other points I mentioned in the introduction was this uh, concept of Macedonian as a, as part of the Balkans, obviously, uh, geographically. It's, it's quite clear that it's true. Um, and also, therefore, in a sense, as a Balkan language. Now, when we talk about Balkan languages, we can really approach it in several senses. One of them is one that's probably more familiar to some members of the audience than myself. And this, of course, is related to some of our previous talks that I was mentioning in the introduction, um, where the sort of autochthonous original you know, Macedonian uh, language probably had something to do with populations occupying the Balkan Peninsula before the Slavs arrived, before the Romans arrived, in a sense, before the Greeks arrived. And um, I think someone else would probably be more qualified to talk on that particular uh, subject. Um, but uh, a second sense of Balkan language uh, looks at it from a slightly later perspective, one I'm more acquainted with. And that is uh, as a language which interacted with and borrowed from other languages uh, in the immediate vicinity. This, of course, is a natural process. Unless you had a language located on an island or an isolated mountaintop, um, you couldn't have anything but that sort of uh, situation happen. And, um, but I think some of the particular you know, uh, patterns that evolve are interesting. And uh, I was thinking just of that example of um, uh, the word bosilek or bosilok, and uh, its connection to the word for, it's basically in a sense of sarsko seke, um, if you take the word for vasilikon. <coughs> but it's been passed not straight from Greek, 
because I, I did say about TV Cohen, at the time it was borrowed, ultimately, in a sense, from Greek culturally. Um, nonetheless, Greek was pronouncing B, as we have in the word basilica, um, as a V already. And if you're familiar with Greek, as probably many of you are in the alphabet, you know that even that letter V uh, was originally pronounced B, it looks like B to the English speaker. And nonetheless, was not pronounced that way at the time this word was borrowed. So what is the medium to which a word like basilicon becomes Botelek, um, Bosilok, and the other changes at the end of the word. But that root meaning king, but as in Basili or Basil, Basileos. How did it, why did it not assume the Greek form? Well, um, the, the best uh, guess we have is that uh, given the presence of Romance speakers in the uh, Balkan Peninsula, not only the Romanians, but really in a sense more relevant in the history of Macedonian, probably the Ottoman um, or Abbasi, um, that there, uh, this was this word is being passed on in a very ancient form, rather directly rather than directly to Greek, but through um, a Romance or Latin-based intermediary, because the change of B into B never took place in, in Latin and in vulgar Latin, the more popularly spoken Latin of the time. Um, that's one example. I could, another one of probably this site is the word porta. Um, when I was uh, doing field work in uh, the region near Berovo, um, uh, in a small uh, village called Umlena, which you probably haven't heard of, uh, there's, uh, it only has uh, the Mali, and it's, it's located off the beaten track. Um, but I was very fortunate to um, encounter traditional um, sort of uh, village uh, hospitality, and uh, one of the people who worked and happened to be working in the hotel said, look, why are you staying in the hotel? Come visit our village, and you can stay in my house for two days. And then you can learn you know, much more directly and immediately from the source. And I said, this is a marvelous opportunity. I'm very grateful when I went. And I met, we, we stepped outside of his house on the second morning we were there. And he opened up, um, and of course I knew the word porta, but I hadn't seen it used on a farm or in that sort of village setting. And he was referring to, and again, this may resonate with some of you, he was referring to the, the, the wooden gate which you opened and closed to let the animals in and out of the yard for. And I thought that was a very interesting you know, evolution, particularly of Porta, which you know, clearly um, comes from you know, the Latin stock, the same word we find in ports in French, and uh, ports of call, ports of entry, a port on your computer or whatever. Um, and it, so you find this sort of a particular you know, fabric in the weaving of um, different um, borrowings, uh, both in words and in other patterns, in represented in Macedonian. Um, that um, is an endless source of fascination, at least for the linguist. Um, maybe a couple of other examples of that kind. Of. Another one that came to mind, I jotted down, uh, this word klisora, in the sense of a narrow pass. It's related, really, uh, in essence, to that word for close, klausura, a uh, place that's closed up relative to the uh, a broad you know, path. Um, I think that sort of gives you, you know, a sense of what I mean when I talk about the linguist perspective. Um, and I was, uh, uh, regarding Macedonian as a Balkan language, but also as a European language. And having talked about that, um, I'd like to pass on um, more to um, what interests um, many people, and that is uh, the connection between Macedonian and Old Church Slavonic. Um, if we look, uh, I'll explain, of course, uh, you know, the, the latter term in the testing case, um, the Macedonian being Staroslovensky Yazik, and if we look at Staroslovensky, we immediately see we're talking about a very old form of Slavic, uh, of the Slavic language. In fact, really, it's the oldest written form. And um, the um, earliest manuscripts that we have date back to the end of the 10th century and the um, beginning of the 11th century. But they clearly reflect a situation um, which was a couple of centuries uh, prior to that in reality. And uh, I'm referring, of course, to um, the formation of this uh, literary language, or the codification of the spoken language, might be a better way to put it, by um, Constantine and Methodius, or as Constantine is better known, Cyril, um, thus being acquiring uh, this name on his deathbed in Rome, in considerable honor, um, and also taking on the vows of uh, monasticism at the time. That's probably the best time to adopt it in your life, I think. <laughs> Though the Orthodox, uh, as compared to the Catholic faith, the Orthodox religion uh, is much more tolerant of, 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 of um, the occupation of priests and, and, and other uh, things. Um, well, 
the, the, the point that I'm really obviously getting at is uh, how do we uh, determine how the connection between masculinity and culture is Slavic? Well, we have clear circumstantial evidence to begin with. And this is simply the, the obvious fact that Cyril and Methodius were uh, native inhabitants of the city of Solon, in Greek Thessaloniki. And um, in the middle of the ninth century, uh, the situation was evolving far to the north, actually, of Macedonia, which uh, concerned the people involved, who were also brother Slavs, so to speak. And I'm referring to the Moravians, um, who are in it, one of the basic stock of Czechoslovakia. Of course, as you know, the Czechs, uh, they use the term Bohemia to refer to really the western part of what we would call the Czech Republic. And Moravia, they say Namoravia, for being in Moravia. That's Czech, Czech for being among the Czechs. So the Moravians have always been, in a sense, different from the Czechs and also different from the Slovaks. And one of them had risen to considerable prominence in the ninth century, and that's with this fellow Rostislav, or we might call him Rostislav. Uh, he whose glory grew, Slava Raste. So a rather uh, wonderful name, and typical of Slavic princes from the time, before they brought the Greek names. They're actually rather more colorful, I would say. Um, Rostislav um, was um, in, uh, dominated, um, rather, rather, his branch of the Moravian um, tribe dominated a, a, a group of four tribes that had formed a considerable small kingdom, not even small really, but centered in Moravia, including parts of Hungary and uh, other parts of Central Europe. Um, and nonetheless, they were feeling considerable pressure from uh, the Franks, in other words, the Germans. And um, the Germans, of course, were um, alleged uh, owed allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but they were sort of going in their own route. And of course, as you know, in history, there was a considerable amount of tension between the emperor, the Holy Roman Empire, as it evolved, and the papal see in Rome. Well, in other words, you couldn't always count on the, the Franks to do exactly the way what Rome might see as fair. And that ties into our history here rather closely. But to go back to the position of Rostislav, he felt um, not only um, cultural, but also uh, certain military pressure from the Franks. And one thing probably that entered into his head, and I'm reconstructing it, just extrapolating from the natural set of circumstances, was to somehow demarcate, differentiate um, his culture from that of the Roman Catholic Frankish culture. And the, the rather uh, brilliant method he chose for that was to turn to the uh, orthodoxy in um, Byzantium and ask for, um, for help here. <laughs> and, uh, but he couldn't turn directly to a Greek speaker for that sort of help. Uh, ultimately, he had to have someone who spoke a Slavic language come and do uh, the apostolic job to bring the Christian faith to um, the Moravians. And uh, so you have this interesting situation developing where in the heart of Central Europe, where you wouldn't expect to find it today, um, the Orthodox uh, faith being uh, taking root. And it takes root uh, by being transplanted from Solon. And that was the task that Cyril and Methodius were entrusted with for Constantine. Now, coming from Solon, um, they were, in a sense, already bilingual. And uh, of course, the names that we have them are Greek. And um, I would leave it up to historians to address the question of, um, in a sense, what was their first language. But we have this rather interesting um, uh, quote that goes straight back to the earliest accounts of uh, the history of Cyril and Methodius. And I will quote it directly from the Old Church Slavic. And it goes something, well, maybe I'm quoting it from memory, so we will take it with a small grain of salt. But the emperor is, said, is alleged to have said in Greek, but this is being written in Old Church Slavic, that, uh, uh, Soluniane, all the people of Solon, Psi, there's all, Psi te. Um, Chisto slo, slo, Slovansky, as it were, pure Slavic language, Vesjedriont, as it were, Zboruvat, Psi te, uh, Chisto Zboruvat, Slovansky, to, to put it that way. And this uh, is very interesting because. Uh, of course, we know that the dominant local population was, in fact, um, Slavic and um, had passed through Macedonia. And that in uh, defining the linguistic situation in Sri Lanka, Solon, that this was so much the case that you could count on anyone, regardless of the background, at least to be able to speak Slovensky. Now, Slovensky here is an interesting term. It's what sort of brings together all the Slavic languages. And you, can, you can refer to them all as depending on the root in the given languages, Russian would be Slavyansky, Um 
Yeah, this is true despite all of the local names that uh, of whatever origin, and they are very diverse origins, both original tribes, incidental factors, let's say the Bulgarian name come from a completely non-Slavic spot. Um, um, let's say Russian, where this name even, the term Rus may have been even borrowed from um, uh, the um, uh, Varankian culture, the Viking culture. Uh, or local tribal names of the sort, Chef, you know, coming from original, uh, probably even a founder of that name of the tribe. But nonetheless, as a cover term, Slo uh, Slovansky or Slavic uh, serves very well. And therefore, it would be anticipated that, given the antiquity and all the connections that existed between the Slavs at the time, that if someone from Solon went to Moravia, uh, it was sort of understood that he'd be able to speak in a language that would be uh, understandable by those people in what is presently Czechoslovakia. This is clearly a different sort of situation than today, even despite all the connections between Macedonia and Czech, I say. Well, uh, their mission succeeded quite well at first, but eventually, of course, uh, the Franks um, um, uh, were uh, able, unfortunately, to um, expel them. And um, we find uh, the rather unfortunate situation that uh, the earliest glagolitic text, which is one of the early uh, Glycolytic being one of the two early um, uh, alphabets, is actually uh, written on Czech soil, uh, the Kiev Missal. It's at least as old as the text that, of the South Slavic uh, origin. Um, despite that, um, the Orthodox faith and uh, Slavic culture in, its, in that particular form um, were not perpetuated there. Um, however, in returning um, back to the South and passing through Pannonia, uh, and eventually being passed on to the disciples of Assyrian Methodius. The Old Church Slavic took root and uh, flourished considerably. And one of its branches fundamentally was that which we can see reflected in Macedonia. Even in the, some of the earlier texts, we find changes going on that uh, reflect um, changes that uh, has to do with the internal development of Old Church Slavic. Whereas Assyrian Methodius, in developing the alphabet, had separate symbols for the word, the root inside the word for day, instead of saying den, they wrote something like yin. Okay? Instead of saying son, they wrote something like sun. Um, given the level of education of Cyril, we know that this wouldn't just be some um, arbitrary concocting of, of letters, uh, but rather something that probably reflected the existence of original sounds. And it's a rather long process of comparison of unsolved languages to come up with the nature of those sounds involving comparison with the rest of the European. But um, nonetheless, um, in the earliest texts um, do have these, these letters in them. And uh, we uh, begin to find a certain confusion uh, in some environments, particularly in the, in the text that comes a little bit later. And that is, instead of writing forms like uh, the word for sleep, sonna, we have an O occurring in the word son. And by the stage that this is happening, we assume that they were no longer saying sudden, simply son, that the final O had lost, been lost in the word, and that in the middle of the word, the O had evolved into O. Well, um, if you compare that situation, let's say, to Bulgarian or Serbian, it's, it's different. I mean, of course, there are differences between Macedonian dialects, but son and san um, in the early text are different from the Macedonian type of son. Then is somewhat shared by Bulgarian, but again, distinct from Serbian when we have Don. Um, there are other features that um, were also attested in the text that we see right to this day in Macedonia. It's obviously an incredibly archaic language and has a very uh, fascinating historical continuity. Forms like Re Rekoch in Ultra Slavic, becoming Rekov, for example, in Macedonian, um, or uh, Nesash, um, or Vidyach, uh, becoming Vida for Vidoch. Um, we find um, forms such as Ronka, or forms like Bend for the word for Ro. To this very day, um, down in certain parts of, of uh, southwestern uh, Macedonia, in the sense of Egeska Macedonia, being preserved in dialects. And it was, it was this sort of um, sense of dialects preserving the older situation that provoked the scholarly interest I referred to in the beginning of my talk. And this scholarly interest was not limited to, um, shall we say, what was then Yugoslavia or, or Bulgaria, but um, you know, found echoes as far away as Russia, 
the great Russian scholar uh, Nikolai Brunovo, in fact, in referring to ultra Slavic, uh, referred to it as a Russian guy. I will quote by him. Um, otherwise, again, I'll have to rely on my somewhat fallible memory. Well, actually, what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll take this and um, he uses it in one phrase, and I'll put it into one sentence. If you want. He refers to um, Staroslavyansky Yazik, Pristavyavshi, uh, representing Nadirna, Adin is Makedonsky Govorov. So, in other words, it's Pristavova Edin of Makedonsky Govorov. Um, this was without any party pre, written in 1933, in a discussion of the orthography of altered Slavic manuscripts. And as really, he was just incidentally noting this as sort of an ex uh, something you could count on, um, given all the linguistic evidence and historical evidence. Um, well, this is uh, sort of an interest of a general kind that <coughs> found resonance as far away as Russia. But um, scholars such as Oblak and um, Grigorovich, who traveled in the Balkans and were more familiar with the actual situation on the ground, so to speak, noticed that um, in villages um, stretching from Solon itself, just a little bit north, the so-called Lagadinsky Tesela, which include two called Suho and Hisoka. Um, the situation we have these sounds Ronka and Mrendole for Rose were actually still being preserved in the speech of the people who lived in the place. Now, of course, if you go to Skopje, you, know, you won't hear these things, unless you happen to be lucky like my wife once was. Um, what do I mean by this? Once when she was uh, near the train station in uh, Skopje, um, a, a small woman approached her, dressed all in black. She was very small very old, and she addressed my wife as Chendo, which is uh, another, which is a dialect form of Chedo. But in fact, it's related to the German word Kind, Chend, and uh, not borrowed from it, but just one of our old uh, common friends, so to speak. And in using that word Chendo, um, she was clearly speaking something that went back to her uh, sort of southern Aegeiska um, heritage. And uh, we find the evidence that this, not only this word like Chendo, but rend, rendove, uh, isn't the word for instead of zap, is um, zon. Uh, forms like this uh, fascinated scholars because the only other language in all of the Slavic speaking world that should have had these texts was Polish, located far at the other extreme of the Slavic continuum, far to the north. Not only that, but these are the, uh, the sorts of sounds that had separate symbols in the alphabet of Cyril and Methodius. They didn't use ah for, for the word for tooth, they didn't have zap. They had something like zon, I think. And yet, you found dialects preserving that down to the present day. And two of them are actually located in present day Albania. And this provoked the interest. They were um, studied by French scholars. Uh, Mazon and Vaillant came and studied the dialect of these. Um, and here we have to forgive me on the details whether that they studied them in situ or by talking to emigres of the uh, village of Voloshtitsa. And not only did they find the nasal dots, but they found a combination of a, a Balkan feature, which is to take a word like Cholek and say Cholekot, or Cholekov, Cholekont, meaning in a sense for a Cholek, uh, to be very specific about a uh, given object. They found that attached to words uh, which were inflected in all their other forms, essentially as in Russian in, in respects. So the word Starts, uh, taking from like Des Starca, but Des Starca Togo, and you were writing a letter, you know, uh, to whom would be Starzu uh, Tomo, or if you're giving um, money to some, some people, you're saying Starzi Tim. And we found a situation where, uh, described well by Mazon uh, and Vyat, where the living forms of Starz in their full nearly full declension are combined with this word, this little, uh, what we call an article, the Ot in Chovek, um, in all forms. Well, what this also suggests is that the, that particular feature, which fits interesting in my study, the development of the Ot, as it were, in Chovek. Um, it's a Balkan feature, true, but it, it isn't something that just got pasted on later. It goes back probably to a stage not far from the time of Cyril and Methodius, maybe a little bit before, a little bit after. But maybe it hadn't made its way directly into their particular dialect, because uh, we don't find evidence for it in OCS uh, as a, in a systematic form. However, I would also suggest that it's conceivable that for 
reasons unknown to the most to us. Uh, Assyrian authorities were familiar with these sorts of patterns, but uh, chose for reasons that are unclear not to use this particular type of uh, Slavic feature in their literary language. And what do I mean by this? Uh, you will find even in very old Slavic texts, forms like rab, rab, the word for slave, but rabot, with an o, not with, not with an o. Um, even though really it comes from rab, the, the, referring to a particular slave. So rabot, or rodos, in the sense of rodos, the particular people or uh, uh, group. Um, you know, that the fact that these sort of pop up accidentally, as it were, in the very oldest text, suggests that they were there, uh, and it's, just, it's just somewhat of a mystery why they weren't incorporated directly uh, into, as it were, the codified form that Sam Methodius adapted. Um, I've really sort of um, touched on, you know, sort of a wide a range of themes. Maybe one most uh, um, interesting fact I'd like to at least try to bring your attention is um, that this pattern that we see of Cholek, the Cholek cult, this sort of spoken, as it were, Balkan pattern, this Macedonian pattern, um, though it didn't make its way in a full form into the language of Cyril Methodius is codified, uh, nonetheless begins uh, it rise in full bloom in, by the 16th century. Um, despite the, what as we call it, um, we still see, we see that um, already by the 16th century attempts are being made to um, put, as it were, down the real living language um, in translating um, the works of a certain preacher named uh, Damaski. And, um, the so-called Damaskinsky uh, text um, uh, reflect the spoken language to an incredible degree. Instead of saying Chudo from Miracle in the old Church Slavic form, you have Chudo to, referring to a specific form. Um, instead of saying Jena, uh, only Jena, you have Jenata. Um, to just take the definite article as one prime example. In other words, you can take these texts written in the 16th to 17th century, um, because the tradition continues. And I read them almost virtually as you know the modern Macedonian language, and um, this also suggests that the fact that it was so much like the modern language by the 16th century that this process of evolution, of sort of the merger, in a sense, of the pure of the original Slavic tradition um, uh, with the, the the Balkan tradition, um, was really well in progress probably even by the time of Cyril Methodius. Um, I think you know there are many questions I might have in, in bringing up some of these uh, particular issues. So, uh, I'd like to leave some time for any questions that you want to ask now or perhaps after Christine's talk. And I'd be glad to do my best to answer them. Thank you for your attention. I hope it wasn't too particularly <laughs> Uh, which 
damages for damage. Yes, right. Yes, yes. Now, the amazing fact is that the trust for language, which is the language uh, in Central and Northern Italy, as well as in Italy, mm -hmm. used exactly the same word, mm -hmm. and uh, was again in the trust. Mm -hmm. uh, which brings a lot of questions uh, for study, yeah. as well as the fact that they're uh, God of daylight, or God of yeah, the middle it's, of the it's definitely connected to that. Yeah. And the word for even day is probably. Exactly. Yeah, so, which is be then, be then, which is to collect for the light. Yes. And it's a profoundly uh, functional word. Yeah. A couple of other words I'd like to point out is the fact that you did say about uh, how we use chove ko, chove ko. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, of great importance in most of the language that I've studied. And yeah. uh, I'd like to point out that ko means like all these activities. As mm -hmm. in Homer and Iliad, it means. For instance, we will say bulk or block, bulk, yes, sir. which is um, wool. Right. Uh, but we would say bulk call, ima de We cannot say bulk ima de It means an activity of the noun. Mm -hmm. You see, and you, you use the bulk call. As, as a, like a general, the general, the wolf, you're using a specific wolf. Yes. In which sense? Do you mean the general sense or the specific sense? I mean the general sense. Right, because that's where it's different from English. This right. particular yeah. uh, wolf right here, yes. all call. Yes. Okay. Now, this is an extremely important in the study of Macedonia because it takes us back to the Iliad, because the functional words in there are all ending like this. Mm -hmm. you know, they will say yeah. local uh, or yeah. local or vocal, mm -hmm. which is found back again mm -hmm. uh, thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point this out. The question that I do have uh, mm -hmm. uh, for you is, mm -hmm. how far do we go back? You know, we talked about either UT and we talked about mm -hmm. Kirill and Methodi, mm -hmm. uh, seven, eight, nine hundred AD, mm -hmm. and you call it Church Salonic, which is fine, it's written in the book. Mm -hmm. But what happened before that? Mm -hmm. It's like, where did this language come from? Mm -hmm. And how was it? This is, I think we should, I mean, I'm asking you, how, yeah. what is your view on this? How do you see that? A Macedonian book in that context, or just as, as an enterprise for uh, being interested in it. Yeah, how, how do you, like, well, how did the Church Slavonic come? That's my question. Where did it come from? Well, the Church Slavonic, um, the oldest, uh, it's clear that the oldest texts that we have come from the 10th, 11th centuries. Now, we, tradition and history suggest that Cyril and Methodius were the ones who were the first to uh, put that down in written form. Now, the fact, however, that uh, Glagolitic might have considerably older origin than Cyrillic um, means that it might have been available as a tool, you know, as one of the means for expressing or codifying the, the spoken language. But um, you know, as it were the direct, um, as it were the existing, see, I would separate um, Old Church Slavic as a corpus, a body of text that we can study from several issues. One would be what, what was the language of Cyril Methodius, because even that is older than the living text. Um, the second thing I would separate it from, but yet related to ultimately, is this question of the other Indo European languages, because that's reconstruction. And reconstruction is based on taking you know, existing data from various epochs and building back to uh, um, you know, forms. And the systems that are, are, you know, extrapolations in a sense. Um, it, it's in a sense, in other words, linguistic archaeology. Um, but we are given, nonetheless, facts. In a sense, but the problem I would say with this is the difference in linguistics. In a sense, is that instead of being given dinosaur bones, which really do come from that period, you are given texts sometimes, such as the Ultra Slavic texts, which do not come directly from that period that you're attempting to reconstruct. But in that sense, it's more. In a very humble sense, I would say, because I consider myself completely um, unqualified to compare myself to anyone doing serious scientific research of the type where we're you know, talking about theories regarding the origin of the universe. Um, but you have, you do have archaeological data to help you there, and there are individuals in the audience who are already pressing, but very interested in um, <laughs> a considerable apparent knowledge of uh, the archaeological factors. Now, but sometimes the you know, archaeological factors are not, you know, are not in written form. So uh, I think that you know, the work on the, the old inscriptions, uh, you know, could lead us uh, an interesting, along interesting lines. Uh, um, sometimes the archaeological evidence is associating old place names or old uh, accounts from, let's say, Herodotus or Pliny the Elder, um, with findings 
be it in just you know uh, the remains of uh, burial sites or you know ceramic pottery or more you know significant cultural achievements such as those in Skopje or Pella um, with a particular you know language and people. Um, but but I guess I'd have to as a linguist I'd have to say that, that with ultra Slavic um, um, I I take it back as far as Sosnothodius and I take Slavic over much farther back. I think what we might call common Slavic, from which the Slavic language is all much farther back, and Indo European yet farther back. But I, I accept I, I I consider them more hypothetical constructs. Well, I know there's a lot of questions, I'll ask one more question. Like if I find the word in or then yeah. functioning in the area, mm -hmm. what do I do with it? Well, how, do I, how do I take it? Because I know that all sorts of well, logic is then, then or me. Yeah, but then in the uh, Iliad, uh, in the Homeric Greek is one of the, uh, one of the negative, negative, negative particles, like that. So, no, like, like who then? The, uh, the right to yeah. the time elapsed in one day. And of course, well, the same yeah. exactly Macedonian today, and this is what I pointed mm -hmm. out. So <laughs> I, I guess I have to see that passage. I mean, it's been a long time since I studied classical Greek, but um, I. Uh, but it, it does yeah. coincide with exactly that, the same in Truscan. Well, that, the it's me, is me is today, mm -hmm. and uh, it relates to. I like, yeah, well, I agree. No, I completely so agree with your etymology like, as far as yeah. speaking language of life. I'm trying to get out of in the European because yeah. it's already formed. You see, yeah. it's already functioned. Yeah. Be day, day, and be day. You see, it's all it's mm -hmm. all related. And even the end, well, even the end in the word for day is a suffix. Originally, and the original root is the one the the di part of it. That's what it's the day was on the end. So I Even the well. word di not or is, not is the word of I one day work. Yeah, that's so that's what today. Yeah, I would I would it, it is your it is this question of what's called an astratic language family, and maybe that could have a general connection to what you're bringing up, which is very interesting. And the so-called it comes from the Latin word for noster in the sense of our, as the word nashinski. Uh, in referring to a broader language group, if you even want to call family. And uh, Russian scholars, um, some very serious Slavists that were, uh, were interested in this. One of them died a tragically early death um, at the age of 35, his name was Dmitry Fitich, his last name. And he attempted, he even con constructed a dictionary of what he called Nostratic. Now, Nostratic from our, our language family, he included not only Indo European, therefore, in a sense, as, a, as a intellectual enterprise, it's similar to the one you're bringing up. It also included Dravidian languages, which are languages of India different from Hindi. It also included uh, Semitic languages, and there are and sort of general similarities between Semitic and European, which I think are things are connected. And um, Ural, Uralic and Altaic, which definitely requires special knowledge to know because we're talking here about Finnic and, and Hungarian being related to the European. Now, that's at a very deep stage of reconstruction or a remote point in time. Now, I haven't come across Etruscan being mentioned in that context, but um, uh, I don't, you know, if one would just have to, you know, bring it down and, and, and confront the two sets of data and see, but, you know, scrape away things like the end in Din, get down to the basic root, as you say, and then determine whether or not the end that you find in Etruscan is the same suffix being added on the Dia, or maybe just an accidental connection because, you know, the, the end is not primary. Okay, I mean, I think it only begins to are there any other questions? Uh, right back there. Yeah. May I bring you back from Etruscan <laughs> to something Slavic? Yeah. Uh, I visited the people who are known as the Sorbs, not Serbs, yeah. but Sorbs. Uh -huh. As you probably know, they yeah. are known as the Rusaki yes. and the or the Wind. Yes. Yeah. They live in an area south of Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, the records there, which are, of course, not to some extent oral, right. go back to the Yes. So we know that the Slavic tongue there mm -hmm. was spoken. Yes. <coughs> oh, it's, yeah, it's quite clear. Now, has any attempt been made to link or to uh, identify or relate the Slavic language which is far in the north mm -hmm. to our Slavic ancestors that's far in the south? What uh, attempts have been made, except by Soviet scholars, which yes. we know from 1945 yeah. on, right. there was a large body of Soviet work for obvious political reasons. Mm -hmm. Someone else academic, they try to build these bridges. Yes. Do you know anything well, that's available to us at the moment? Available uh, <laughs> to at the moment. Um, that, I can refer you to a volume um, which has recently come
come out. It's a survey line, but it, it, it treats uh, Sorbian among the other Slavic languages. And since the volume is done on a reasonably uniform basis, and it's actually been reviewed by my colleague, Christina Kramer, I can at least recommend it as a reference work. But it's, it is a very uh, steep price, however, uh, even if you go to Atticus Bookstore on Ulster Street. Um, and this is a work edited by Bernard Comrie and Grenville Corbett, two English scholars, and um, contributed to by um, my eminent predecessor um, at the University of Toronto, David Huntley, Professor David Huntley, now retired. Um, and Sorbian is mentioned among them, and there's uh, a full chapter devoted to it. Um, uh, I'm less familiar with the data from Sorbian, though I do recall that, in general, the patterns that you see there, at least in terms of you know, like the surface forms of them, look much more like things you get in Polish, like Kruva for, for cow, as opposed to Krava. Um, but the, the root itself, Sor, is co cognate with that that you see in sort of the one for the Serbians themselves. Um, and the fact that, the, and that also Wind is also presumably uh, one of the old, very ancient names for the Slav. The Vainigi, the name of that particular name for Slav, goes back to a map by Claudius Ptolemy, put together in the second century AD as situated on the Vistula River up in po near Poland, in Poland. And therefore, you know, it's conceivable that one of the tribes called Venigi um, is, is passed on in the sense of wind or windish. Um, Lusatian appears to be, you know, as it were, the tertiary term there. But um, Sorbian is related to sort of uh, wind to Venigi. Um, so uh, there's, there's one of those instances like this, um, where we have a very ancient Slavic um, tribal name preserved. But historically, I mean, linguistically, it's connected more closely to Polish. Uh, and there's a difference between upper, as they call it, and lower Lusatian. Upper is actually more to the south, because it depends on the river. It's on the upper part reaches of the river, which flows for it. But upper and lower Lusatian are even different between each other. Can I just mention a point? Did Ray have a, a section on uh, Sorbian it's in It's great to know the Gray. Yeah. Th yeah. This volume has uh, superseded the Gray. Of oh. course, it's more extensive. And the Gray was in three lines, though. So, yeah, the original was in one. Yeah, I know. Only the original. Yeah, it's not yeah. bad. I just got the subclass. I started on the prayer. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't make the interest. Slavic of public. Thanks. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank well, you. You mentioned Rostislav, and yes. I was impressed that you connected it with Rastislava. Yeah. yeah. Let's mention a couple other names like Stanislav, Vladislav, Miroslav. Yeah, yeah. Slavic. They all have connection with what? The Slav is mm -hmm. connected there. Yes. No, that's one, to Slavic. No, one mm -hmm. thing to one. That's, 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 that's another point. That's our problem, you see, the Slavic. Mm -hmm. When we connect the Slav with Slava, which means glory, mm -hmm. then we forgot one thing. You mentioned only for a moment the orthodoxy, mm -hmm. but you neglected to mention what is in Macedonian or Slavic. in the so-called Slavic languages, the languages orthodox. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, Pravoslava. The Stanislav, Vladislav, Miroslav, Rastislav, mm -hmm. we say that they're all connected with Slava. Mm -hmm. Now, Pravoslava is the key. If Pravoslava stands for orthodox, mm -hmm. it naturally is not an English terminology, which will translate in English as righteous glory, right. to be close enough. Yes. I know. Right. Yeah. Because otherwise you can't, I mean, righteous, right, straight, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Now, the Slavic <laughs> confuses not only you, but everyone, all the Slavic people on this earth, so called Slavic people. Since we connected that to Pravoslav, just imagine for a second that instead of Orthodox, all, Prav all, all Orthodox people are called Pravoslavs. What will that tell you? Because that is the same thing. The only thing is that the world accepted it as orthodox. Now, the Greeks would be Slavs. Uh, or Jew, so Jew orthodox would be a Slav. And every other proud Slav would be a Slav. So that would, wouldn't confine the uh, Slavic people into these uh, so-called coincidentally speaking the similar languages. You're taking that to a point of absurdity, right? I'm taking to. I'm taking. <laughs> no, no, I think it's. Thank you very much. If, if you were. I'm taking it to a point that or Slavic, that Slav or Slavic, mm -hmm. means nothing if it is not in conjunction oh, with Pravoslav. 
Well, forget about the names that we mentioned. They all want, one wants to be the Slavic, the other one the other one the other one the other one the peacefully to, to be Slavic. Right. But the main connection is the Prava Slava. The Slavic or Slav or Slavonic or Slovenic was invented to destroy Macedonia. As simple as that. What is your right. question? There is no question. Okay. I just okay. wanted to, okay. to make a comment. Someone else yeah. who has a question. Sorry. Because uh, we have two more people for questions, and then we'll have our break. Uh, because we have another speaker today as well. Peter? My question is a reference to My question is this. Uh, always put a bit of reference to the classical Greek. And to me, uh, I find that this is a... Uh, this is a big question mark, first of all, because the word Greek never came into origin until about the 16th century. It's Hellas. Well, what do you mean by classical Greek, and how do you refer to that? When I use a classical Greek form, well, the, f the first thing I would do is I go to the Dylan Scott's dictionary, or the Greek English dictionary, which is based on um, the text. Now, it is true that when we say classical Greek, you're talking about the language of Plato, you're talking about the language of Herodotus. Are you talking about the language of the um, Hellenistic? You, well, know? you answered my yeah. question. In other words, in other words, each one of these people had their own particular language, and there was no one no. language. Oh no, no, I wouldn't say that. Yeah, quite yeah. fair. <laughs> I would say there are different there are different dialects of Greeks attested yeah. early on in different, uh, like you know, Aeolic and Doric and Lesbic. They're all they're they're different to some degree or another. Herodotus wrote in the Ionic dialect, and well, they were, but they're fundamentally all Greek. What did they refer to it themselves? We're talking about Plato and the other. No, well, you know, Hellenic, obviously. Or, or they refer to it as their own local, their own local term, as they said this long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, that's the English word. Yeah. Due to the fact that Solon at that time was uh, inhabited with uh, different kind of people, like uh, ancient Macedonian, Slavic Macedonian, mm -hmm. Greek, yeah. Jewish, and some others, yeah. I'm interested, I'm interested to find out uh, what origin are Cyril and Methodist? Or better, I would ask you, are they Macedonians? I would consider them Macedonians. Now, if, you know, the question is, what does that mean in that historical context? And um, beyond what I've read in the account of the life of, of, of you know, uh, Constantine, um, I, I really I can't go beyond that, except to say that um, it was clear that uh, they spoke um, the, the Macedonian language of that region, and that this, in a sense, was virtually um, you know, their native tongue. Now, um, if there's other evidence that um, suggests which particular ethnic group is, so to speak, uh, inhabiting Solon they originally moved directly from, I'm, really, I'm not an historian, I don't feel myself qualified to answer, but there may be people in the audience who would be willing to answer. Um, and we're going to have to, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cut it off. You certainly can go at him afterwards. Uh, <laughs> uh, not when, much of me left. <laughs> uh, but we do, want, we do want to break before you're, um, you know, you get tired and start walking up and getting coffee and interrupting other people. Uh, we have uh, various uh, books back there for sale. You can order a tape of today's uh, event, um, and there's forms on your seat about that. Uh, please add your name for a mailing list if we haven't got you on a mailing list. And also, Christina has brought some books that uh, she would be delighted to autograph. Thank you. Um, and in, indeed, it is an honor to introduce my colleague Christina Kramer of the Slavic Department of the University of Toronto. Um, Christina Kramer uh, did her doctoral work at the University of North Carolina and studied with uh, a very eminent Macedonianist, I would say, uh, Victor Friedman. Um, and uh, I think that um, it, she certainly has priority, priority with respect to me in Macedonian studies and certainly got her, her PhD in that area for me. She also, of course, did uh, field work, as I did in Macedonia proper, and uh, worked um, with uh, the use of uh, present past tenses and aspects and questions of this kind in the Macedonian language. And as you know, is a mainstay of um, the Macedonian language teaching um, in our Toronto community. 
Um, I hope I worked anything important out. Um, here's uh, Christine Kramer. Thank you. by asking the question, is Macedonia and Bulgaria? No way. No way. <laughs> the other way, I don't think so. I, I should say I said the other way around. I was hoping That's for something favorite. provocative. <laughs> <laughs> my. I got more than I bargained for. So, obviously the short and obvious answer is no. Macedonian is not Bulgarian. <laughs> I will talk longer than that. Because the follow-up question might be, why even pose such a question? Exactly. <laughs> My talk today will answer that question, as well as provide a more detailed answer to the first question, is Macedonian Bulgarian? I'm going to begin uh, the answer to the second question, why even pose the question, by referring back to um, the newspaper Macedonian Tribune, published by the MPO, for an edition that came out in January 28, 1993, in which there were two articles. One was published in both English and Bulgarian and emphasized the separateness and distinctness of the Macedonian language. In the same issue, there was a second article which reiterated the Bulgarian point of view that Macedonian is a false language created by decree in 1944 and was imposed by terror and force. Where's the truth? To begin to answer this question, we must turn back several centuries to the Ottoman Empire. As some of the stuff that I refer to, I'm sure all of you know in bits and pieces, and I hope my talk at least brings some of this material together for you, hopefully for the first time. I hope it's new and interesting for all of you. During the periods of Ottoman rule, as you may know, in the Balkans, people were designated by religion under the so-called Milet system. Under this system, if you were Muslim, you were called Turkish, and if you were Christian, you were called Greek. Obviously, different rights and obligations fell to you depending upon which group you were classified in. All Slavic-speaking Christians were called Greeks because they went to the Orthodox Church. Such a system obviously gave great power to the Greek church hierarchy and a great deal of status to Greek as the language of religious schooling. By the end of the 18th and early 19th century, the Milet system was breaking down for reasons not all of which are relevant here, but it's enough to say that this breakdown was connected with two things in particular, the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire and the rise of nationalism in Europe. We often forget that the concept of nation state that we're so familiar with today was in large part, is in large part, a result of events that took place in Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries. And so when Professor Shallard says, well, how are we to interpret the term Macedonian at the time of Cyril and Methodius, we can't interpret these terms as the national nation state terms of the 19th and 20th centuries. We must keep in mind the historical perspective. The Slavic peoples of the Balkan Peninsula also began to exert pressures for national and linguistic recognition and independence. Unfortunately for the subsequent development of Macedonian, the Macedonians, for reasons I which, which I will explain, lagged behind the Serbs and Bulgarians in the establishment of a clear national identity and a standard recognized literary language. Both, both Serbo-Croatian and Bulgarian were not standardized until the end of the 19th century. But Macedonian did not receive official recognition until 1944. What's most relevant for my talk today is what was happening among Macedonians and Bulgarian intellectuals during the 19th century. After discussing the development of Macedonian as a distinct language from Bulgarian, 
I'd like to discuss problems of Macedonian national and linguistic recognition in Bulgaria up to the present. At the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries, while the processes of forming contemporary nation states as we know them now, certainly as we know them in the 1990s, was just beginning, Macedonia was still under Turkish rule and it served as a battleground on which various Balkan states waged the struggle for both political and cultural domination, including the use of their literary languages. While contemporary Macedonian clearly has its roots in medieval Slavic literature, I'm speaking of contemporary written Macedonian, has its roots in medieval Slavic texts, and there are elements of Macedonian colloquial, that is, reflections of spoken Macedonian in the Damascene text that Professor Schallert just spoke of, the long Greek domination in religion and education during the centuries of Turkish rule favored Greek as the language of higher learning. In southern Macedonia, the Cyrillic writing tradition died out, and local writers who wrote in Macedonian had to employ Greek script. So we find in the first half of the 19th century, translations of the Gospels translated into the local Macedonian vernacular. When I say vernacular, I mean the language just as people spoke it, using Greek letters. Dimitar Miladinov of the Baraki Miladinovsi used Greek letters when he went out and transcribed Macedonian songs, and then later transcribed them into Cyrillic for the published versions. Grigor Prlicev, in the 1860s, wrote his speeches in Ohri dialect, in the Greek alphabet, but for his poetic texts and translations, he employed Cyrillic writing, Kyrgyzsa. The introduction of Macedonian popular language into literature at the beginning of the 19th century is also connected with the first writers of a new Macedonian literature. Because you must recall that during the period of Turkish rule, there was a break in the old Slavic tradition in the Balkans. So in the 18th, 19th centuries, we have writers again exerting their national linguistic identities. And so when I speak of writers of a new Macedonian literature, I am speaking of these people like Joachim Kurczowski and Kirill Pecinovich, who began writing again Polnaschi. Although the languages of these authors is clearly based on Macedonian dialect, both Kurczowski and Kirill Pecinovich stated on the title pages of their book, Bulgarsky Yudik, Bulgarsky Yadik, important distinction. This term, this term was the name given to all Bulgarian and Macedonian dialects under Turkish rule. And it was not used in the narrow national sense that we use that term today. Other people writing in Macedonian dialects sought other names for the language that they were writing in. Jordan Kaji Konstantin Gina, for example, in 1854, uses the term Slavyansky, Bulgaro-Srpski, for the language of the populations in Skopje and Prila. The terms that we use freely, Makedonets, Makedonski, became reestablished as the term in the mid-19th century. As Blazik Koneski, one of the founders of the modern codified language, as he noted, despite this literary activity, there was still no appropriate administrative effort to create a new standardized literary language there was no clear idea of what form that language would take, and quite frankly, there was no idea of how to carry it out under Turkish rule. Yet, even at this early date, there were those who fought for a modern language that would be written the way people speak, and who were opposed to going back and using Church Slavonic as the base of a new standardized Slavic language. Teodosi Sinaitsky wrote in the foreword to Pecinovich's book, Uteshenyi Greshnim, and I quote, it's so lovely, Church Slavonic is a golden key, but the popular language of Pecinovich is a key of iron and steel, better suited to open the heart of the common simple man. So in the first half of the 19th century, the first modern publications using Macedonian dialect as a base appeared. Major figures of this period published religious and other works in languages based on local dialect rather than in Greek. These works are important because they give evidence that the Slavic populations were seeking a written language based on their speech in opposition to the Hellenizing effects of the Greek Orthodox Church to which both Bulgarians and Macedonians belonged, and also against the archaizers 
who wanted to turn back to Church Slavonic as a basis of the written language. Again, as Blanda Konevsky said, the creation of a contemporary literary language, you need more than a few people who are trying to write in this language. You need some common sense of united national identity. And under the Turkish rule at this time, the, uh, the formation of such a cohesive unit was difficult to form, particularly given the fact that the population of Macedonia was predominantly poor, uneducated, and quite frankly concerned with more pressing matters. In the 1850s and 60s, questions concerning which dialect base to choose as, a, as the basis for a standard language began, again being, began to be asked. Things were looking pretty good in the 1860s. The economy was a little better. Meanwhile, because of this change in the economy, some progress had been made in the general education in Macedonia and in the formation of an educated class. The main struggle of the Balkan Slavs up to this point had been against the Byzantine Patriarch, and the Macedonians and Bulgarians sought common ground against this pervasive Greek influence. The Slavic intellectual circles were divided on how to proceed, however, and they favored different solutions among them. These included the Illyrian movement, which called for a common language for all South Slavs. This movement gradually faded. We know from the historical context that it did not succeed. The only thing it did achieve was the establishment of a common Serbo-Croatian language. There were two other different opinions on the selection of a literary language amongst the Macedonians and the Bulgarians. One view stated it was necessary to create a common Macedonian-Bulgarian language. The other called from the beginning for a separate Macedonian language. Among Macedonians from both groups, however, the unifying theme was that they would not support the introduction of any language into Macedonia which did not take into account specifically the centuries-old Macedonian tradition. It must, be kept in it must be kept in mind that there's no clear linguistic line between Macedonian and Bulgarian and Serbo-Croatian. That what we have in the Balkans, it's not like we can say here we have French and there's a line where it becomes German. What you have in, the, in all of South Slav territory, I could even extend it further north through much of Slav territory, is a situation where people in village A understand people in village B, and B understands village C with no problem, and C understands D, but A and D can't figure out what they're talking about. And so it becomes difficult to decide at what point is it this and at what point is it that. So again, as Victor Friedman argues, at this time, the Macedonians sought common ground with the Bulgarians in the unified struggle against Greek. Macedonian into, into, intellectuals envisioned a compromise between various Macedonian and Bulgarian dialect forms, or dialect features, in the creation of a mosquito bulgarian language. The most frequently cited problems in this uh, enterprise, however, in this unified languages, was the dialects really were too different for people to understand one another, particularly between speakers of Macedonian dialects and speakers of the far eastern Bulgarian dialect. The newspaper Pravo, published in Bulgaria in 1869, wrote that Macedonian Bulgarians understand eastern Danubian Bulgarians and vice versa, worse than either understands Church Slavonic. As a result of this, there was no consensus on a choice of dialect base for a joint standard language. By the early 1870s, with the establishment of the Bulgarian Exarchate, that is the Bulgarian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, the Bulgarians had fully rejected a linguistic compromise, they adopted an eastern base standard, and they publicly adopted the attitude that Macedonian was, quite frankly, a degenerate dialect, and it was high time the Macedonians should learn Bulgarian. Macedonians such, such as um, Shapkarev publicly espoused the view of a linguistic compromise and then went about merrily publishing textbooks based purely on Macedonian features. Those who had supported a common Bulgaro-Macedonian literary language had conceived of the language as a compromise, that is, equal weight to Bulgarian and Macedonian tradition. Any solution without Macedonian characteristics was unacceptable. Parteni Zogradsky was the main Macedonian supporter of this idea, but when the compromise fell apart and the Bulg Bulgarians rejected this compromise and opted for an Eastern-based standard, so Gorazki became the target of rather um, 
vitriolic attacks by Bulgarian intellectuals. A campaign immediately began for special textbooks to be written in Macedonian, a project carried out in part by Tartani Zograsi, Kuzman Shapkarev, Dimitar Makenovsky, and others. All this discussion of the diverse opinions on a dialect base for a standard Slavic literary language give evidence to the fact that during the centuries of Turkish rule, two literary traditions had arisen, an Eastern one and a Western one centered around Ochim. With this recognition among its intellectuals became a desire for the reestablishment of the Ochid, the Ochid Archbishopric. The establishment of the Bulgarian Exarchate had significant ramifications on the populations of Macedonia. If you will recall, under the Milet system, which was still in effect, the population was identified by religion. So, if you were Orthodox, you were Greek. If you were Muslim, you were Turk. Now, with the establishment of a, of a Bulgarian Orthodox Church, all the Slavic populations of this territory could choose a Slavic identity. It would be as if somebody comes in and says, OK, you have to choose. Check the box. Are you red, or are you yellow, or are you blue? Well, you're green, but there isn't a box green, and you have to choose. Well, blue looks a little more palatable than choosing red. And so a lot of Macedonians opted for a Bulgarian identity under the Milet system, because this at least gave them room to identify themselves as a Slavic Orthodox population rather than Greek. Hmm. Meanwhile, by the end of the 19th century, first decades of the 20th century, the Serbs and the Bulgarians and the Greeks all now have some of the main ingredients one needs for national identity. They have a standardized, accepted, codified literary language, and they have an autocephalous national Orthodox Church. And then what did they do? They decided to fight over Macedonia to get new members. And so there became a fight for the hearts and minds of the Macedonians. And so the Macedonians, just at the moment when they were prepared to start the formation of a separate, codified, standardized Macedonian language, Serbs, Bulgarians, and Greeks were opening schools and thwarting all attempts of the Macedonians for the standardization of their own language. All these events led to the growth of a national consciousness among Macedonians and a sharp counter-reaction from the Bulgarians. Georgi Pulevsky wrote in 1875, Macedonians too are a nation, and their place is Macedonia. He called on learned people to compose a Macedonian grammar. Temko Popov in 1888 wrote, the national spirit in Macedonia today has reached such a degree that if Jesus Christ himself came down from heaven, he could not persuade a Macedonian that he is a Bulgarian or a Serb. In the final decades of the 90s, as I said before, other Balkan states, namely Serbia, Greece, and Bulgaria, were competing for, the, for affiliation of Macedonian Slavs. However, there were voices of reason, if you will. Uh, Stojan Novakovic wrote in, in the newspaper Otajmina in 1888, Finally, there is one more phenomenon which must not be lost, which must not be lost sight of, the Macedonians' aspiration to remain themselves. Kostin Misirkov wrote his work on Macedonian matters in 1903. It was the most significant contribution to the elaboration of the Macedonian language up to that time. Misirkov proposed a language based on the West Central dialect, which did eventually form the dialect base for modern standardized Macedonian. He also recognized the significance of a national language for national identity. To quote Misirkov, the creation of a literary language is a spiritual necessity among us in order to put an end to the abuse of our interests. All of Misirkov's books were confiscated and burned in Sofia, but a few copies eventually made their way into the hands of people who could subsequently reprint it. Events of the early 20th century solidified the development of a separate modern Macedonian language. At the close of the Second Balkan War, the Treaty of Bucharest, signed on the 10th of August 1913, partitioned Macedonia among Bulgaria, Greece, and Serbia. This treaty thwarted all the attempts at Macedonian linguistic and cultural unity. As Andrew Rosas wrote, and as he emphasizes, this event resulted in the division of, of a region which had, 
since the era of warring, warring dynastic states in the medieval Balkans, comprised of economic and ethnocultural union. The linguistic result was that the Macedonian language continued to develop asymmetrically in the different parts of Macedonia. In Vardar Macedonia, it subsequently um, was treated by the Yugoslav government of the time as a South Serbian dialect, but the Yugoslav government of the time did permit uh, Macedonian literature to, to develop on a limited base as dialect literature. Dramas were performed by Vasil Izrovsky, Anton Tama, Christo Kurle. Poetry volumes appeared by Kochoratsin, Venko Markovsky, Kola Nidelkovsky. Although the Serbs permitted the pub publication of so-called dialect literature in Macedonian, the official language in Vardar Macedonia was Serbian, which was used in all official sphere spheres of public life, including schooling. The advantage of this was it led the local population to become quite clear in the view that they were not Serbs. During this interwar period, there was a lot of linguistic activity by Western scholars outside the Balkans who published studies emphasizing the distinctness of Macedonian as a separate language transitional between Serbo-Croatian and Bulgarian. In the late 1920s, the Balkan Communist parties recognized the separateness of the Macedonian. But it was not until 1934 that the common term ruled that the Macedonians had a right to exist as a separate people with a separate language, a policy which led ultimately to the recognition of the Macedonian standard language. In April, um, however, in April 1941, the Bulgarian government was allowed by Hitler to occupy most of Macedonia. At first, the local population welcomed in the Bulgarians as their liberators from the Serbs. But it didn't take too much time until the liberators themselves were seen as the new colonial oppressors and the partisan movement gathered strength in Macedonia. In December 1943, a document was issued by the Bulgarian Communist Party, which seemed to call for a return to the common term line of the mid-1920s, that is, for an independent Macedonia within a Balkan federation. The Macedonian People's Republic was proclaimed in the Prokopchinsky Monastery, with Macedonian as the official language on August 2nd, 1944. I won't go into the subsequent developments of the Prokhorpachinsky Monastery. I will just mention in passing that it certainly has been in the news again recently. The Macedonian literary language was thus codified after nearly a century of intellectual debate and not, as suggested in Bulgarian scholarship, the result of a language born like the birth of Athena out of Zeus's head by proclamation, developed artificially by committee, and imposed on a population by force. From 1944 through 1946, the governments of Yugoslavia and Bulgaria discussed the possible unification of Macedonian territories. In 1946, the Bulgarian government, headed by Georgi Dimitrov, both of whose parents were Macedonian, recognized Macedonia as a separate ethnicity with a separate language. This recognition resulted in newspaper articles and scholar, I'm sorry, this recognition is reflected in newspaper and articles and scholarly works of this period. With the new political reality began more serious, a, a serious step for the affirmation of the Macedonian literary language in Piri, Macedonia. In 1947, Macedonian language, literature, and national history were taught in all elementary schools and gymnasia in Piri, in which there were approximately 32,000 students enrolled. Teachers and student exchanges were carried out between Piri and Varda, Macedonia. 96 teachers were sent from Varda, Macedonia, and 148 students were sent to Skopje to study as teachers to come back and teach in the schools in Piri. Also in 1947, the first Macedonian bookstore opened up in Gorna Dumaya, followed by the opening of bookstores in Petrich and Nevrokop. The bookstores sold Macedonian literary works, newspapers, magazines, school books, and you know, sort of the works. The first Macedonian regional theater opened in Gorna Dumaya in 1947 with Anton Tanov's play Pechalberi. In 1949, a Macedonian amateur theater opened up with the same play in Sofia itself. By the end of 1947, all attempts to solve the Macedonian question through a Yugoslav-Bulgarian federation broke down. Stalin declared the time was not right to change the status quo. The cultural exchanges and the development of Macedonia as an official language in Pirin came to an end with the Tito-Stalin break in 1948, which led to the deterioration of relations between Bulgaria and Macedonia. In 1948, after the Tito-Stalin split, the Communist Party of Greece 
decided they could um, take advantage of the schism, as it were, and began the formation. They tried to form a Macedonian micro literary language based on the Larian dialect to counteract the Tinoist grammar of Kepeti. A reader and a grammar were published in the Latin dialect, but whose grammatical descriptions were based on Bulgarian grammar. These Greek grammars based on the Latin dialect were sent off to the children who were to be taught Macedonian in children's homes in Czechoslovakia and Poland and elsewhere. But the children's home teachers rejected this as a split of the Macedonian language. And they reverted to um, instruction using the Kepeti grammars but the Latin grammars were not, did not go to naught because I'm told by some children that they were used in the classrooms to explain to the children how the language was not supposed to look. <laughs> and the one copy that finally made its way um, down to me through um, a Polish scholar from a Macedonian actually has all sorts of squiggles in the margins and corrections of the text. It's really quite cute. Well, some recognition of a separate Macedonian language and ethnicity persisted in Bulgarians through 1956. Bulgarian policy returned to its earlier denunciation and campaign against the language. In December 1989, the Mladenov government voted to reverse Todor Zhiskov's policies of a, a population assimilation. While some degree of recognition was granted to the Turkish minority, the ongoing political shift did not change the official government view that there was no ethnic Macedonian minority in Bulgaria. Despite the official attitude of party leaders, Macedonian political activity in Pilin continued. In 1989, the Macedonian organization Ilinden, claiming to represent 250,000 ethnic Macedonians, organized a rally in Sofia demanding cultural and national autonomy. Further evidence of political activity in Pilin was documented in a series of articles in the Macedonian newspaper Nova Macedonia, which in 1990 ran a series entitled Among the Macedonians in Pilin, Macedonia. The articles focused on individual lives touched by Macedonian-Bulgarian relations, as well as the general profile of the region. There were reports of imprisonment and discrimination in employment against Macedonians. Many of those interviewed stated that democratic processes sweeping Bulgaria did not have relevance for the Macedonians of Pirin and for their organization, Ilinden. The United Macedonian Organization, Ilinden, continues to agitate for recognition of ethnic Macedonians. The Bulgarian government views this as activity as Skopje intervention in their national affairs. What may be a representative example of this conflict was the attempt by Macedonians in the spring of 1993 to lay a wreath at the grave of the revolutionary hero Yane Sandansi and the subsequent crackdown by police. The situation continues to the present with the Zhelef government, which has explicitly stated that while it recognizes a politically independent state of Macedonia, it does not recognize a separate language and ethnicity of Macedonians. The Orthodox Church represents another battleground for ethnic loyalties among, between Macedonians and Bulgarians. While the, um, there are obviously Bulgarians and Macedonians in Bulgaria who um, are of Orthodox faith, the Bulgarian Exarchate does not recognize the authority of the Macedonian Autocephalous Church. But the Archbishop recently claimed that he would recognize the authority of that church when the Serbian Archbishop did, an event not likely to take place. The Bulgarian scholarly community considers all Macedonian dialects to be Bulgarian. As Lunt and others have pointed out, linguistic factors are readily available to support this ideology. Since both Macedonian and Bulgarian shared a unique development separating them from the rest of Slavic languages, including the loss of noun declensions, the definite article that Professor Schallert spoke of, the loss of an infinitive-like forms to go in Macedonia to say sakam daodam, these are unique developments for Macedonian, Bulgarian, and South Serbian. As a result, Bulgarian linguists have claimed that any dialect that might have those features is de facto Bulgarian. The Macedonian literary language is referred to in all scientific literature as a written regional variant. This view was expressed most completely in the 1978 um, anonymous publication of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences <coughs> republished as a separate book with an English in 1980. But this view has not changed in recent years. A collection of articles on various aspects of nationalism in the Balkans, national problems in the Balkans, published in Sofia in 1992, gives the most complete recent statement concerning the status of Macedonians, which, given the attitudes of the Zhelev government, is not going to change very soon. One should give special mention here also to a number of authors, many of whom I've spoken of early, 
earlier in this paper, who are claimed by both Bulgaria and Macedonia as national writers. These include all 19th century writers who wrote in Macedonian dialects, such as Dimitar and Konstantin Miladinov, and Jean Sizov, as well as the 20th century writers Venko Markovsky and Nikola Vapsarov, who was president of the Macedonian Literary Circle in Sofia. Although Markovsky was on the one hand hailed by the Bulgarians as an example of Bulgarian nationalist writers since he left Macedonia and moved to Bulgaria, on the other hand, he was roundly criticized for translating his works into, quote, Macedonian dialect, since Markovsky himself claimed his countrymen would not have understood him if he wrote it in Bulgarian. In order to approximate the numbers of ethnic Macedonians in Bulgaria, it's helpful to look at statistics from several different censuses. The population figures for the 1946 census were never made public by the Bulgarian authorities, but several works have attempted to uh, fill in the data. Poulton, uh, who works for a human rights group in England, noting the conflicting figures in successive census, uh, censuses, gives the following figures of the 1946 census taken from Yugoslav sources. In 1946, 252,908 people claimed themselves to be ethnic Macedonians. This population lived predominantly in the Pirin region, as reflected in the data from Kisalinovsky, who gives the following percentages for Macedonians by region. I'm just going to give you some of these numbers, just to give you some idea, since, as you'll see in later censuses, all these people miraculously vanished. In Pet Petvich, in the census, was 85 to 90 percent Macedonian. Feti Vrach, 80 to 85 percent. Nevrokop, 60 to 65 percent. Razlog, 55 to 60 percent. Gorza Jumaya, 45 to 50 percent. A document containing a survey of schools, pupils, and teachers in Pirin, Macedonia from 1946 to 47, cited in the Macedonian work called The Historical Truth, also reflects a high number of Macedonian students. For example, in this survey, there were 32,399 Macedonian students enrolled, compared with 3,074 Bulgarian students. Although there were political changes towards the Macedonian question in the years 1948 to 1958, the Communist Party of Bulgaria continued to recognize the Macedonian name and language, as can be seen in the census figures of 1950, 1956, in which almost 64% of the population in Pirin declared itself Macedonian. In the 1965 census, according to Poulton's figures, the number of people declaring themselves to be Macedonian dropped to 8,750. And in the, in the Blagojevgrad district, less than 1% claimed itself to be of Macedonian ethnicity. The official Bulgarian censuses have thus shown ever-decreasing numbers of Macedonians up to the 1990 census, when questions of ethnicity were introduced back into the census for the first time since the 1956 census. However, Macedonian was not one of the categories you could check off. Sorry. So the Bulgarian census of December 1992 asked questions concerning ethnicity. Bulgarian nationalists protested this, saying that this question was incredibly divisive, that it would lead to a splintering of the nation along ethnic lines, and such ethnic questions should not be included in the census. The census did, however, um, contain questions concerning ethnicity, but again, Macedonian was not one of the allowable choices. The ethnic Macedonian organization Ilinden in Pirin complained to a number of international organizations over the Bulgarian refusal to include Macedonian as a separate, eth separate ethnicity. Mac News, since we're now all on um, cruising the internet, some of us in an old Model T Ford and bumping along the internet as best as we can, the electronic news media, Mac News, declared that in early reporting in the census, Pet in Petrich and Sandansky, up to 30% of the population declared itself as Macedonian, and apparently, um, and reportedly, it, and it was reportedly announced on Bulgarian television that 20 to 30% of the population in Sandansky and Petrich just declared themselves on the census as Macedonian. Remember, this where you didn't even have a box that you could check off. So this was you know, scribbling over the thing. On Mac News, again, um, February, from February 1993, the Bulgarian president was reported to have told the newspaper Nova Macedonia that there were problems with the census in the Pirin region, saying that tens of thousands had stated they were another nationality. Jelic did not say what that other nationality was. Other incidents have been reported from Pirin, where, for example, on the 4th of December 1992, police arrested an activist of Ilinden as he put up a poster calling on Bulgarian Macedonians 
to declare themselves as an ethnic unit distinct from Bulgarians. Bulgaria's population, as of the first reporting of the Bulgarian census of December 1992, was 8,472,729. Since, according to their first official report, there are no Macedonians in Bulgaria, I turned to the Encyclopedia Britannica World Book, 1992, and extrapolated from their figures. According to their figures, the Macedonian population makes up 2.5% of the population estimated by them at 9 million. Furthermore, the World Book gives the following figures for mother tongue in Bulgaria. Bulgarian, 7,680,000. There are figures for Turkish. Macedonian, 230,000. So we actually see a very stable Macedonian population in Pidgin. It's unlikely that official Bulgarian policy will change soon. Bulgarian recognition of an, of an independent Macedonia may ultimately provide a base for eventual recognition of Macedonian as well. There have been meetings between government and cultural delegations. Jelef, for example, went to Skopje in early 1993 to participate in the launching of the Macedonian translation of his memoirs. If there's no Macedonian language, I'm not quite sure what language he was going to the launching of his memoirs in, but that's for another paper. There are some students from Piri in Macedonia who are currently studying at the University of Kiril and Metodi in Skopje. But it's clear, that it's clear that there are speakers in Bulgaria who, while knowing standard Bulgaria, continue to use non-standard, i.e. Macedonian speech, in certain situations. Further evidence of a persistent use of Macedonia in Pirin, uh, one can determine these things through rather devious ways. There are little handbooks that are published for teachers to teach their young students Bulgarian. And if you go through these little books, it tells you the mistakes that students might be making. And so you go through and you thumb through and you find the mistakes that the students are making. And lo and behold, the problem is these students are speaking Macedonian. Um, up to the present, there have been no grammars of Macedonian written in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is mentioned, but only as a dialect variant of standard Bulgarian in numerous works. For, for example, the Dialect Atlas of Bulgarian, published by the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, as well as numerous handbooks on standard Bulgaria, includes all regions of Macedonia in their dialect descriptions. There is one Macedonian-Bulgarian dictionary which was published close to now on, I'd say 15, 20 years ago in Skopje. Is Macedonian Bulgarian? Of course not. It's a silly question. So why then ask the question? Because the legitimacy of the answer that you can provide to that question must be defended with knowledge of the past, knowledge of the Macedonian literary language, the relationship that existed between Bulgarian and Macedonian in the centuries under Turkish rule, and ultimately knowledge of the, the victory that was attained with difficulty by Macedonians for self-determination. Thank you. I was just wondering, why do you have to call it Macedonian Orthodox Autocephalus? Although Kefali was stolen from Macedonian Gaul anyway, mm -hmm. but it's so badly distorted that it doesn't make sense to the people that don't know the meaning of the Gaul. Can I just say something? Yeah. You know, there were two brilliant Macedonian scholars who died in the last year. And I'm going to answer your question by speaking, if I will, in their memory. One is Blaja Koneski, who in his 20s became the youngest member of the commission and uh, for the standardization of Macedonian, and one of the people who fought the hardest for modern Macedonia within the Yugoslav situation. And the other was Vignev Gol, who was um, a young student in Poland who became acquainted with Macedonian through his contact with the, the Deta Belgowski, who came to Poland when he was a young student. And he did numerous studies. And I remember when I first gave a talk on my dissertation at the University of Chicago, Professor Gold, who was already getting old, standing up, why do we need all these new terms? We're talking about the same thing. And so I would say to you, yes, we could have no ter new terms, but we all know what orthodoxy means. We all know what autocephalus means. And I'd rather talk about the guts of the matter. 
not then is should we call it travel slav? I think that begs it begs the question. But why do you think it's a new term? Who said that travel slavna, samostalna, or uh -huh. uh, is is a new term? Who who says that? I'm saying that it's not current usage, I and so it obfuscates the English issue. World doesn't know it because yes. we live in an English I think world. it's a great campaign. And if you want to start the campaign, I think well, that's it's not great. A campaign. We are getting to the bottom of it, and that's the only way to get to the bottom of it. This way, you'll kill it with one shot, two birds, because the Pravo Slavia will be heard all over the world in its original form, and the Slavic will cause so, whir so much whirling that people will know the truth finally. Well, that's great. I'm glad you have, a, you have your task laid out for you. I know what my task is. And it's nice that there's room for all of us. And when you to say work on this. when you say yazik, you corrected yourself so so hastily instead of yazik. Well, it doesn't make any difference whether it's yazik, yenzik, yazik. It's a Macedonian dialect. See, until we get to understand that those so-called Slavic languages are based on a Macedonian. Well, you know what? We won't have any. I've spent a whole time gathering answers, so I'm geared up to answer things. So instead of discussion, let's discuss something. Just questions rather than discussion. Next set, is there anyone else? I have a question about Bulgarian. Um, and that boils down to, uh, I guess, my knowledge. Probably because of the old Slavic, and probably because I had a few more drinks. But, uh, <laughs> but the, I think there's some. Uh, are there elements of Tartar type of words in Bulgarian? Because again, we're talking about the leadership of Bulgaria no. politically coming in. The poor Volga Bulgar. It's really sad what happened they to didn't, them. They didn't bring any words over. Only their name. They basically left their name Volga Bulgar to the local population, and then were absorbed in the local population, leaving. Really, almost nothing behind. A few questionable words. All these Bulgarians say there's 40 Tartar words or Bulgar words in their language, but nobody can tell me one. I keep asking, right? And nobody can tell they're, me. They're too busy raping the Slavic women. I <laughs> love it. There is a wonderful uh, sentence in my Turkish grammar. I'm, I'm studying Turkish this year, and there is a sentence the Bulgarians are Turks. It is their language which makes them Slav. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> they claim to be the descendants of the Khans, but never spoke of the Khans. Stand up so that we can really hear the rest of you. Aye, just so people can hear you. That's why. What language did they write in before? No, okay. I'm so glad you asked because it lets me clarify that the Bulgarian view is that Macedonian was created yes, in 1944. Like a J, which is a, a, a Latin J. You know, actually, that J is such a brilliant spelling convention I that I—it's it's yeah. wonderful. And it was—I could teach every Slavic language so much easier if everyone else had adopted it. <laughs> what I meant to say was, and, and appreciate the opportunity to say again, that what happened in 1944 was that the language that had been spoken was now standardized. So there was now a grammar which laid out rules for teaching. There were rules so that people writing could conform to a common standard. And the language after 1944 became the official language. I understand that, but the people from Nisi and Macedonia, what language were they writing in before this was official in 1944? What? Macedonian. Of course Macedonian. They were writing in different scripts. And then uh, this gentleman said that the Bulgarians are not Slavic. I don't know what Okay, I will answer that, but let me just comment on what the, what the Aegeans were writing in. The Aegeans, in the early 20s, the Greeks actually did recognize Macedonian. And they published a primer to be used in Egeiska Macedonia, written in Lerinsko, using a, a Latin alphabet. The choice of the Latin alphabet was to try and cut Macedonians off from a Cyrillic uh, tradition. But still, the Greeks did publish these works. And then, before they could actually dis be disseminated out to the schools, the Greek government had a change of heart and clamped down and said, no, as a matter of fact, we can't distribute the grammars because there are no Macedonians and there's no language. What 
he was referring to is that the name Bulgaria, your Professor Shalit was talking about the names of the different Slavic peoples. Well, the name Bulgaria actually is inherited from a, a group of um, Tatar or Turkic peoples who, set, who had settled along the Volga. They were called the Volga Bulgars. And they had come into the Balkans, you know, marauding and pillaging and doing the usual things that people do. And then they settled down and were absorbed the local population. And so it's really only the name that's Turkish, Turkic. And they're not Slavic, you're saying? The I'm saying that Slavic. they are. The population that's left is, certainly. Right. They were Slavicized, exactly. You know, I think when we talk about names, we really need to remember that if I say that I'm a Tarantonian, and Toronto is a, a Native American term of origin, by saying I'm a Tarantonian does not mean I'm a Native American. It means I've moved into a place and I've adopted the same. So I think we need sometimes to keep that in mind. Um, Nicola, and then the gentleman over there. Thank you. I have only one question, and I'll make it as simple as I can. Uh, uh, we all know from history, in fact, uh, how it was that in the seventh century, the Tatars came uh, to the Macedonian region at that time, and they were these people, Macedonian nice, I should say, or uh, basically uh, to, to melt into the bigger population. Does anybody or in your field of work uh, know how much people did they came or were they, uh, uh, is it a number, this magic? Uh, I'm sure there are people who have studied it, but I have no idea. So really, my area of interest, in all fairness, really doesn't go back much earlier than the 18th century. Over here. Uh, Professor Kramer, last year I have a chance to ask the editor of Macedon's term, Prisoner. Uh, I, have, I was objecting why he's printing the newspaper in Bulgaria. And he said, my friend, he said, this is not Bulgarian alphabet. This is an old Macedonian alphabet before 90, which was used before 1994. Uh, 1944. 1944. So I didn't complain much because I wasn't well knowledge in that area. Now my question is, would you elaborate a little bit more about this? I'd be happy to because that's actually a very good question. Thanks. And the, que the question refers to the fact that in, if you will, the Bulgarian alphabet does in many ways reflect um, an older writing system. What we have to remember is, is that as an alphabet is being developed, it has to account for the specific sounds that exist in that language. So, for example, Bulgarian does not have a k and a g, which develop in Macedonian dialects. It's one of the distinguishing features of the West Central Macedonian dialect on which the literary language was based. And so, through the centuries as people tried to write Macedonian, they came up with different solutions for writing kya gya, since such a, a, there was no letter that corresponded with the sound. It was Kirsten Misirkov who proposed using the diacritic of the little slash lines for kya gya, because you can't write a kya gya using the form of the letters as we inherited it from Old Slavonic. Now, there was a lot of controversy when the language was being codified and when the language first, the language committee first proposed an alphabet to the committees in uh, 1943, I think, the alphabet was rejected by the committee. And it went back under review, and it was at this time that they adopted for the, the symbol kya gya, for um, the letter J, for the sound gya, which I think, quite frankly, was a brilliant solution though uh, Blaja Koneski came under intense, uh, under really quite uh, intense attack during the election several years ago by uh, Vumiro de Plumene, saying that by introducing the letter Y, he had actually sold Macedonia down the river to the Serbs. Where from a linguist's point of view, I think this was a very cogent and reasonable um, option to choose. It also makes Macedonian look quite different from Bulgarian and Russian. Uh, furthermore, um, Mas the people who codified Macedonian decided to 
reject the inclusion of, if you read Bulgarian, there's a little letter that looks kind of like a little B with a little tail sticking off the back. It's the, it's the sound of uh in Bulgarian. And, and hmm? That's right. But the little, if I can draw it in your direction, hold on. Stonk, stonk, stonk. It used to be the hard sign, though, didn't it? <laughs> this letter, which in Bulgarian is a, uh, that one, which is a, uh, well, when they were arguing whether or not to include it in the alphabet, it does exist in many Macedonian dialects, but it does not exist in the West Central dialect on which the standard language was based. And so the alphabet committee decided that a compromise would be to, if you'll forgive me. Do you? So if you wanted to write a Turkish word that sounds, had the uh sound in it, there would be an apostrophe. Like like, or in the dialect forms of bluk, dervo, um, slozi, you say slozi? Salzi. Okay, salzi would be spelled with this apostrophe. And so, yes, the modern Macedonian alphabet is different, but there were, I think, very sound linguistic as well as political reasons for opting for that compromise. And I think it would be legitimate to go back to him and say, okay, let's not argue about an alphabet. Why do you publish articles saying that Macedonian didn't exist until 1944, was imposed by terror and force, when it's patently not true? If it was imposed by Excuse terror and force, they would have stopped speaking it. <laughs> you can't impose a language by terror and force. I, I, I saw a hand go up there. Yes, they did. But they couldn't get rid of Macedonian. Uh, question over here. Stand up, please, so that we'll see. They couldn't. Yes. Mrs. Kramer, maybe you can uh, give us some indication if you know whether the uh, Bulgarian was taken from Macedonia or Macedonia from Bulgaria in the 9th century. Uh, to me, it's what, sort of a moot question. I, you know, what, uh, what I was reading, actually, is that uh, the Bulgarians, when they came in the 7th century, already Macedonians were in the 6th century, and the Pliny the Elder, you know, reported already in 5570 uh, that, that they, they plundered the Peloponnese already. Well, I think it's a very fun question, and, but uh, one that I don't think I can answer. And, and what I what I know too is that you know they were ruled by the Turks, uh, Bulgars that came uh, to 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 the Balkans mm -hmm. until 967, when they actually mm -hmm. started uh, the Slavianization. They adopted. Then, therefore, here in Macedonia was already a hundred years earlier. Well, you know, how we could actually take, you know, like they claim that we were going to miss me, this one does. Bullshit. May I quote you on that? The reason it's a difficult question is unfortunately, at the time, people weren't using these terms the way they use them now. I take great exception with the Bulgarians who go around calling Old Church Slavonic a Stato Bulgar music. Because this is the same idiocy of obviously language Bulgarian and Macedonian have common ancestors. Modern Macedonian and Bulgarian have common ancestors. So, Bashmia got it. But isn't true also that the uh, Bulgarian alphabet is the Russian? Uh, no, actually, every. You know, they took it from the Russia of Russi. Well, again, there's a. Th it's a, in conjunction with Peter's question that every Slavic language that ended up using Cyrillic had to readopt the Cyrillic alphabet to accommodate the sounds that were in that language. So, for example, Bulgarian and Russian both have, this is really crude. <laughs> they both have this. But in Bulgarian, in Bulgarian, that's a sht. But no, in Bulgarian, it's a sht. Like in Old Church Slavonic, apparently. But in Russian, it's a sh. 
for a church. And they have a church. Church. But interesting in Mapanoia in our region where that would be stuff. That sound in a word in North Macedonian or in Bulgarian is still ja, zashto, instead of zashto, right? Nezdo. It's to keep us busy. Yeah. 